morning. It's great to see each of you here today. Welcome. John? Y'all believe it's going to be Easter in two weeks? Man, next Sunday will be Palm Sunday, and uh, we'll be observing communion. And Palm Sunday is the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey with the people waving the palm branches saying, Hosanna in the highest. And then we see the Easter week or Holy Week with Christ <clears throat> observing Passover on Thursday, uh, being betrayed by Judas on Thursday night, crucified Friday morning. But we know that that wasn't the end. On Sunday, he rose again <clears throat> in victory. So to get us in the mindset of coming Easter, we're, uh, we're talking about uh, forgiveness today. And how many of y'all appreciate the forgiveness that you have in Jesus Christ? <clears throat> Not the most beautiful and most precious and amazing gift that Christ <clears throat> would offer himself, a perfect sinless sacrifice to die on the cross, to suffer, shed his blood, offer his body as a payment to take the punishment I deserve and you deserve and take it upon himself, washing away our sins, past, present, and future. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing that Christ has offered us, and I pray that if you've not received that gift of salvation, that you'll receive that today. It, uh, it's free to you, but it costs him everything. And uh, how many of you also know, as we talk about forgiveness today, that <clears throat> it's a two-way street, that when we've been forgiven, how many of you know that God wants for us to forgive others? And how many of you know that that's not an easy thing to do? <clears throat> Any of you struggle with, with forgiving? Uh, you tend to hang on to things. It's like, oh, they hurt me, and oh, I can't forget that, and I can't let go of that. So today's message will actually be a story that will help us to see uh, that that's exactly what is required of us. And I think Jesus reminds us of this in the Lord's Prayer, which we see in all the Gospels. But Matthew 6, uh, Jesus uh, taught them how to pray. Remember the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then, y'all help me out, what does it say? It says, forgive us our debts as we forgive, yeah, we forgive our debtors. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against me. And, and then, but, the, but the human part of us says, but they trespassed. They were not where support they were supposed to be. They, 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 they swerved out of their lane and got into my lane. They wrecked my life. They caused problems. They, they hurt me. Uh, how do I deal with that? Well, it's called forgiveness. It means letting go. Letting go doesn't mean forgetting. It just means that you consciously choose to not hold that person responsible. You give them to God. You give that situation to God. And that's not easy. We'll acknowledge that today. But uh, we have a plea for forgiveness today. So today we're going to go ahead and put up the Bible bookshelf so that you can actually see uh, where we are and uh, we're going through all the 66 books in five years. And it's amazing, isn't it, how God speaks to us uh, through the, uh, the law. And, and he speaks to us through uh, the prophets and through prophecy. And he speaks to us through history. And he speaks to us through the poetry. And then in the New Testament, he's speaking to us through this great gospel, these gospel stories proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. And he also... There's a new method in here, in here, what's called the letters or the epistles. And so that whole bottom shelf down there, you have Paul's epistles in the blue, and then you have the general epistles in the red. And so today we're on that far right blue book, which is Philemon. We'll be looking at that today. And just in case you didn't know, but the way that they organize within our Bible, the letters of Paul is according to length. So it's not chronological, but length. So that means Romans is the longest book. So that makes Philippian the what? I mean, Philemon the what? The shortest. That's right. Just one chapter, 25 verses, but a very, very meaningful 25 verses. The Bible Project, which I highly recommend, it's on YouTube. Uh, it's also in the, the U version, but uh, it has like an overview of the Bible. And you kind of watch this little video, but they say, quote, Philemon is explosive <laughs> is the word that they use. And, and I would agree. You're going to see a lot of things that uh, would have been very countercultural to their day, which we kind of accept today as, as, you know, the way things are. 
But back in that time, we have to recognize that the Bible was written to a context, to a group of people, to a culture. Just as we were in Deuteronomy last week, uh, the culture was the people in the wilderness going into the promised land. Today's culture, we're looking at a Roman world, a Roman-dominated world, a world where the Romans were the undisputed masters of the known world, and they had an incredible military. And so uh, let's um, <clears throat> look at the fact that the, the first little idea here that's on your outline, if you have an outline, go ahead and pull that out, and we'll be in Philippians. But even though I am, have been wrong, we can show love and forgiveness to others. Even though we may have been wrong, we can show love and forgiveness to others. That's the first uh, kind of a summary statement at the beginning of your outline. And I saw the, the map up there. We'll go ahead and just talk about the map real fast. And then <laughs> Sorry, Jane. Um, <clears throat> so as we, as we look at this map, we just want to help us realize that this is the culture. This is the Roman world. And Paul is in prison. So this is what we call a prison epistle. He wrote four prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and then this letter of Philemon. And so he's writing from a prison in Rome. So you can see Rome up there on the far left-hand side up at the top. That's the capital of Rome, uh, the capital of uh, that empire. It had a million people living there. And then Paul, uh, you can see the different churches that he was uh, responsible for starting through his missionary journeys. And so you, you have Ephesus. Ephesus was Paul's hub for about two years. And uh, Paul did some amazing things in Ephesus, and I'll, I'll refer to that here in a minute with what happened in Ephesus, but as a result of what Paul did in Ephesus, then he was able to affect both Colossae and Laodicea. And so we have Paul as the author. It's a prison epistle. It's written from a Roman prison. So this is a prison epistle. And then written to Philemon, a wealthy man who hosted a church in his home. And it was written about Onesimus, a runaway Y'all help me out. What does it say? A runaway what? A runaway slave. So this is the culture that is existing at this time. And, and so the Bible is going to deal with some very uh, important uh, details here, some very important uh, life lessons for all of us. So slavery was part of the Roman Empire. And so as you know about the Romans, they were very expansionist. They were very militaristic. And man, they meant business, and they were organized with their legions and their legionnaires, and they would march into an area, let's say that they're going to go into Gaul, they would take their legions into Gaul, and man, they would conquer. You know, the Gaul was where the French were, they would go and fight up against the Germanic tribes, they would go all the way up into, into Britain and have some incredible battles and things there, but one of the spoils of war were people. So they would capture the people, and then the people would become slaves. And so you would have the young children, the young girls, the young women, the young boys. Uh, they would often be sold by the Roman government to these wealthy households, and these would often be household servants or household slaves. And so they would perform different duties around the house. And then also some of them would uh, work in the fields. In fact, all the Roman roads were built by slaves. Slave labor would build the Roman roads, the Roman aqueducts, and so slavery was just a common reality back then that the gospel and the good news has changed our mindset of. See, this is what we have to really get back to. It's so important that we have a biblical mindset. This is so important for us today because there, there's a danger in, in, in going back to the way things used to be. And... Um, you know, Christ gives freedom. Christ tells us, and the Bible tells us to care for, for those who are weak, you know, the, the widows. And so that means that babies, you know, are to be protected, you know, even in the womb. This is what the scripture teaches us. And so, but to the Romans and to the world's way of thinking, might makes right, right? And that the strong will survive. And so that's a worldly kind of a mindset. And... Um, what's dangerous is, is that when we begin adopting those worldly mindsets, and so as a science lover, I've told you this before, my mom was a science teacher, and I actually 
I was minored in biology, and I, I majored in agriculture, so I have a Bachelor of Science. And I took lots of science. And so, uh, but one of the things that I didn't like in science was when they kind of shifted away from Darwin's 1820 theory of evolution to try to push it more mainstream. And so what's dangerous about that whole mainstream idea of natural selection and the strong will survive is that people like Adolf Hitler grab onto that and go, yeah, you know, there's some races that are better than other races and we've got to rid the world of these lesser races. So that's a dangerous worldly mindset that leads to mass catastrophe and death. And those of us who know the Bible know that the Bible says that there is one race, right? There is the human race and that he created male and female and that from one man he made all the nations. This is what the word of God says. And so anytime we are kind of the, the stupidity begins to take over and people start talking about races, no, no, no. Bible people, believers, we know what God says. There's one race, the human race, and Christ died for people. He loves people. We're the ones who separate out into these different categories, and we're the ones that start saying that this is better than that. Not so in the Bible, and you're going to see that today. There's a very important lesson that we also grab onto and hang onto and push back against worldly ideas that are going to continue to pop their ugly heads up. And I'm sorry to see it happening today, but we seem like we're moving backwards instead of moving towards what God would have us do. So it's written about Onesimus, a runaway slave, and we'll be dealing with that today. Let me pray for us before we get into our word. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how practical it is, how relevant it is, and how it speaks to our very lives this day. Lord, today as we look at your word, we pray that you would speak to us and show us how we are to love, how we are to see people, how we are to forgive, how we are to operate within your kingdom. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's dive in. Philemon, if you have a Bible, we'll be in chapter, well, the only chapter, chapter 1, verse 1. <laughs> uh, we'll also put the verses up there. Paul, he's the author, as we said before. Paul is the author, and I want to notice what you said. He said, he said, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. This is a little bit different of an opening than Paul normally has, and I'll talk about that in a second. But basically, think about Christianity, how often it's different. For instance, crucifixion was considered a shameful thing, and it was a terrible way to die, and it was, it was you know, for the worst of the worst. And so, but we as believers, we hold up crucifixion and the crucifixion of Christ is, is a powerful thing and a wonderful thing. And it's not shameful, it's not awful, but it's wonderful because that's what God used to save the world through Jesus Christ. And so the crucifixion gets elevated as something like, wow, thank you, Jesus. And then this whole idea, I don't care what culture you're in, but being a prisoner is normally a bad thing, right? Oh, I, I did jail time. I was in prison and, and I served time. Normally pe people kind of hang their head when they say stuff like that. Notice what Paul says is like, hey, I'm a prisoner. And not just I'm a prisoner of, of Rome, but what does he say? I'm a prisoner of who? I'm a prisoner of Christ. In other words, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. That means if I'm in prison, that's where Christ has me at this moment. And when I'm supposed to be free, Christ will have me free. But right now, while I'm right here, I'm serving Christ. And so wherever you may find yourself, you may find yourself in a difficult situation. Guess what? God can still work powerfully in that situation. Maybe you're a prisoner to a bed or to something. I'm not sure what you're a prisoner to, but God is working behind the scenes in ways you could never imagine. So Paul is in prison, but think about this for a second. Paul's an active guy. He's hardcore, type A personality, push, push, push. God puts him in prison. He's like, okay, Paul, time to write some letters. And so some of his most incredible writing happens while he's in prison. And so that might be like, oh, I'm in prison. Guess what I'm going to do? Give me a pen, and the gospel is going to continue to spread. Even though he's in prison, he's writing, and he's impacting lives. When uh, Philippians closes, this is another prison epistle. Paul says, uh, all the saints greet you, especially those from Caesar's household. 
Caesar's household. This was when Nero was in power. And so Caesar's household was, was accepting Christ. How'd that happen? Because Paul was chained to a Roman guard uh, on shifts. And as he's chained to the guard, Paul's sharing about Jesus. And so every four or five hours, a new guard's being chained to Paul. They're like, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. And, and Paul's telling all these guys about Jesus. And they're going back at their Praetorian guard. And so they, they kind of are guarding the palace. And they're telling, you know, hey, guess what I heard today? And so they're talking, you know, to Caesar's family. And Caesar's family, Nero's family, or becoming Christians because of the influence and the gospel of Paul that he's sharing about Jesus. Isn't that incredible? It's mind-blowing. Writing letters, sharing the gospel. See, he may have been chained, but the gospel was not chained. You may be in some form of chain or bondage, but what God's doing is not. So just realize that more is happening than you, than you can see. So Paul, I'm not a prisoner of Rome. No, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Timothy, he always mentions Timothy because Timothy's his protege. Timothy's his uh, you know, succession plan or whatever. So that was a clear. To <clears throat> Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker. So just notice that right off the bat. Who is Philemon? He's a dear friend. He's someone that Paul knows dearly. And not only is he a dear friend, but he is a fellow worker. That's really important that you understand that. How many of you know that being a believer means that there's, there's work you got to do? <laughs> it's not sitting around, you know, on a nice ivory couch and going, oh, isn't it great to sing Kumbaya and all that? No, there's work to be done. And, and Philemon was involved in that work. Philemon actually hosted a church in his home. Which means that's a lot of work. Can you imagine having you know, a lot of people coming over every single week, maybe multiple times during the week? We've got to wash their feet, and we've got to uh, have some food for them and some refreshments for them. And we're going to be doing communion, so, man, we've got to keep all the wine coming and the bread. And, and oh, we've got this widow that's got this need, and we've got to take care of this widow. And, oh, we've got this we've got to do. And, oh, yeah, and, and they're going to invite three new people, so we've got to put out three, four more chairs. And so he, that guy is, like, rolling up his sleeves and he's working for the Lord. That's who Philemon was. Not only him, but his wife. Amen? <laughs> to to Aphia. <laughs> That's his wife. So his wife, Aphia, she's involved in this now. So she gets, she gets a, a shout out, right? So, you know, Nikki, way to go. Jennifer, man, good, good on y'all. Uh, our sister and to Archippus, our fellow soldier. Now, how many of you know that being a believer means that you're a soldier, right? That there's warfare, spiritual warfare that you're facing. It's not easy being a follower of Jesus Christ. There is people coming at you. The devil's coming at you. It's, uh, you got to be disciplined. Paul gave all kinds of soldier references all throughout the scriptures. Grateful for our soldiers because they recognize what that is. My son's a soldier, man, and he's like up early running, doing his push-ups, his pull-ups, and, and it's discipline. And so to be a believer means that it's not a slouchy, lazy lifestyle. He's a soldier. And, and, and here's what we need to know, because if you do a search on Archippus, you'll see that he comes up again. So when Paul wrote these epistles, he had the, the epistle, a letter to the Ephesians, the epistle to the Colossians, and then this one to Philemon, which were probably all delivered by the same person at the same time. Now let me read to you Colossians chapter 4, because Archippus gets mentioned here. So uh, if, Colossians chapter 4, now when this epistle, he's talking to the Colossian church, when this epistle is read among you, so you can see what they did in church, they would read the, the letters and, and like, like we're doing here, when this is read among you, then also read it to the church in Laodicea, verse 17, and say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. So there is a very good chance that Archippus is actually the pastor of that home church. And so it's a whole family's involved. You got Philemon hosting the church. You got Archippus, who is the pastor. They were either in Colossae, the church of Colossae, or they were in Laodicea. We're not sure which one because he mentions read it to Colossae, read it to Laodicea. So there's kind of a discussion, you know, was Philemon at Laodicea or Colossae? We don't know, but he had a house church. 
And I don't know if you know this or not, but back in early church history, early church times, for the first 300 years, where did churches meet? They met in homes. That's why I love when there's Bible studies in homes, because that is very, very biblical. We didn't have, a, we didn't have church buildings until about the 3rd century. It wasn't until Constantine in 323 said, oh, guess what? I'm going to make Christianity the religion of the Roman Empire. Then you began seeing churches pop up. Before that, it was in homes, and it was usually in, in uh, people who had a decent size home, like Philemon or like Lydia, who you read in, in, in Philippians. She had the church in her home, or John Mark's mother, she had a church in her home. So, so churches were in homes. And so he's writing to this family, a ministry family, that they're working, they're serving, they're on the front lines. Grace and peace to you, our God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers. Verse 5, notice this grapevine. Because I hear about your faith in the Lord. So even though Paul is in prison, we notice that he gets lots and lots of different guests and people coming to visit him. So he was probably on house arrest, which meant people could come visit him. So Paul will always list these different names. Yeah, Luke's with me and Demas is with me and, and uh, you know, Titus and Timothy. And he has all these different names of people. So there's like coming and going. People are like coming to give him reports of how, what's happening in the providences. And this is what's happening in this church. And this is what's happening in this church. And this is what's happening in this church. And when Paul would, he'd be, he'd be encouraged by that, but then he'd also hear about a problem and go, well, you know what, let me write a letter and try to fix that problem. How many of you have problems? Any of you have problems? Uh, well, good, because that's exactly why these letters were written. These letters were written to address these problems that we all have. And what do we do in this situation? And Paul helps us. And the letters help us understand how to deal with these various problems. So Paul is hearing good news when it comes to Philemon. He says, I, I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. Wow, what an encouragement. I hear about your faith and I hear about your love for all the saints. So what do you think about Philemon so far? He seems like a pretty good guy, doesn't he? He's a guy who has a church in his home. He's a fellow worker. He's got a son who's a soldier for the Lord. He's got um, a lot of faith. And he has a lot of love for the saints, which means that he's probably like caring for the widows and the sick and, and, and just doing a lot for people in the community. I pray you may be active in sharing your faith so that you'll have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Jesus. Isn't that awesome? So when we share our faith, we have a greater understanding of all that God is doing. Verse 7, your love has given me, y'all help me out with a say, your love has given me what? Great joy and what? encouragement. So here's Paul sitting in a jail, and yet he has great joy from what he hears, great encouragement from what he hears. Have you ever been encouraged by watching people serve Jesus and watching people live out their Christian faith? That's what's so, so important about the church is that we gather together and we, we discuss, and this is what God's doing in my life, and we see people you know, cleaning the toilets and mowing the grass and all the stuff that goes on. I'm like, wow, what an amazing group of people that this is, you know, and it's just encouraging to see the work of the Lord uh, moving forward and realizing that we're a part of something so much bigger than ourselves. He says, I'm encouraged. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement. I may be in a prison, but I've got encouragement hearing about what you're doing. Wow. Because of you, brother, you have refreshed the hearts of the saints. That is powerful right there. You know, if you think about people, have you ever noticed that people, sometimes their hearts are kind of dry? Sometimes their hearts are kind of discouraged. Sometimes their hearts are broken. And uh, because of what Philemon is doing, he's like actually refreshing the heart and, and building up the heart and encouraging the heart and helping the broken heart and the sad heart and the lonely heart. He's refreshing the hearts of the saints. What a powerful statement. What, what if all of us decided, man, that's what I want to do. I want to be someone who's refreshing the hearts of the saints. What a great calling. What a great description. So Paul is saying these wonderful things to Philemon. You're a dear brother. You're a fellow servant. 
Appreciate you hosting the church. Appreciate you loving people, serving them, uh, your faith, the refreshing that you do to everybody. Man, what a guy. Verse 8. It's all going to change right here. Boom! Eight, verse 8 has this shift. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold, normally Paul is bold, right? In fact, whenever he writes his epistles, he like puts out those credentials like, okay, FBI right here, uh, the police, you know, I'm, I'm telling you this, I, I'm an apostle, I saw Jesus, you know, uh, I've got the authority. And, and Paul would often kind of start that way with his, with his letters to churches. But with Philemon, he's like, man, Philemon, you and I, you, we're, we're brothers and we're close and we're buddies. And, and, and now he's like saying, although I could be bold, although I could flash my credentials in order for you to do what you ought to do, Think about that for a minute. There's some things that you ought to be doing. All of us ought to be doing. Yet I appeal to you on the basis of what? What does it say? The basis of? Isn't that more powerful? To appeal to someone on the basis of love versus guilt, shame, or fear. Oh, wow. See, we learned this last week in Deuteronomy chapter 30. See, God has says, I've set before you life and death, and I want you to choose. Please, please choose life. Because God has not made us robots, has he? And so when we choose, we are choosing for ourselves. And so true love means that you have a choice. And so God wants us to choose freely to love him. And so whenever we're asking people to do things, when it's motivated out of love as opposed to, well, I got to, and I should, and I have to, you know, that's that's no way to live, right? And so Paul is speaking to his brother like, okay, we're brothers, and, 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 and let's do this out of love. So what's, um, what, what's, what's this ask going to be about? Uh, something you ought to do, and I'm appealing to you. Well, what, what is this? I appeal to you, verse 10. Okay, here it is. As, as Philemon's reading this letter, he's like, okay, oh, what, what's he appealing to me about? What's he should, what's, what should I ought to do? And then here it is, verse 10. I appeal to you for my, my what? My son. Whoa, <laughs> Paul has a son? Now, when you think about that, that's pretty heavy. And then, I mean, when we go off to camp and someone's like joking like, hey, you know, and I'm a sponsor going off to camp or whatever, like be sure you keep an eye on my kid, right? Keep an eye on my son. Uh, take care of my daughter. And that holds a lot of weight, doesn't it? Like, oh, shoot, man, this is a big deal. Yeah, I better keep an eye on that son or daughter because that son or daughter means something to someone. Right? This is now very, very personal. This is my son. Ooh, I don't want to <laughs> do anything to hurt the son relationship here. I appeal to you for my son. What? Who's the son? Onesimus? Oh, man. Who became my son while I was in chains. So while Paul is in chains, he meets Onesimus. Now, I want you to think about the craziness of this right now. Remember the math that we had up earlier? Paul's in Rome. Philemon is probably in Laodicea or Colossae. He's a wealthy landowner. He's got him a house, and he's got some slaves because that's just what they did back then. So he purchased a slave, and it might have been a teenager, right, or a 20-year-old. And uh, so the, 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 the slave runs away. Why did he run away? We don't know. I mean, it looks like Philemon's a pretty decent guy. So all we can do is speculate. Why did, why did Onesimus run away? Well, maybe he was from the region of Gaul, and he had his little household gods. And so all of a sudden now Philemon and their house are worshiping Jesus. He's like, that's not right. I mean, we need to be worshiping whatever it is. And I can't believe they're having church here. I don't want to hear anything more about Jesus. I'm tired of this Jesus person. They're always reading scriptures. They're always singing and all this love stuff. i got to get out of here. I mean, we don't know why, but he just decided, man, I, I'm done with this. And he bolts. And so he's like a prodigal son. He runs from one saint and finds in the arms of another saint. Think about that for a minute. The craziness of that. Here he goes to a city to run away, and he's in a city of a million people. And who does he come across? But the Apostle Paul. <laughs> That's what we call a divine appointment, right? Right? One of those situations where, you know, this is not by accident. Here, Philemon is actually running from God, but he's not running from God because God was right there with him the whole time. 
So maybe he was being convicted of how he should live, and he didn't want to hear about that, so he decides to leave. We don't know, but we do know that he finds himself in audience with the apostle Paul. Now think about how that conversation went for a second. Tell me about your life. Well, actually, I'm a runaway slave. Oh, well, tell me more. Where are you from? Colossae, really? Oh, man, I got some good friends from there. Well, yeah, you know, who do you know in Colossae? Well, yeah, my, my master was Philemon. Philemon, are you kidding me? That, that actually, I led that guy to the Lord. Can you believe that? And uh, how did that conversation go? Just talking about people that they knew and the fact that he was running away. Man, it's just unbelievable how God works. And so Onesimus is now a son to Paul, which means that Paul led him to Christ. Paul is discipling him. And so he says, I've healed thee from my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he's become useful both to you and me. This is Paul's play on words. The word Onesimus means useful. And so Paul says he was useless. Now he is useful. And so this kind of reminds me that when we run away from God, we're being pretty useless. But when we embrace the Lord and we begin doing what it's called us to do, we become useful in his kingdom. So it's a beautiful picture of a runaway, running from God, running. You can't run from God, can you? <laughs> so he thinks he's running from God, but then he actually runs into Paul and he becomes a believer anyway. And, and running away was a very dangerous thing to do, by the way. Uh, if you were a slave and you ran away, see, Rome was very strict. And they were all about the order. And so when they conquered people and they put you in chains and said, you're a slave, you stayed a slave. Uh, and if you ran away, uh, bad things could happen. They would often brand a big F on the forehead. And uh, so that means that, um, you know, you might be stuck in a galley, you know, rowing a boat all the time until you die. Uh, you might be uh, crucified, killed. It was a bad Bad thing being a runaway. Why would he run away? Why would he take that risk? To me, I just personally think that, that he was probably a teenager or a 20-year-old, right? That's what I think. He's like, how many of you ever made mistakes as a teenager or a 20-year-old? It's like, you might have run away too, even though there's danger, even though it's, it's, it's a bad idea. How many of you did dumb things even though you know it was a bad idea? So I, I kind of picture Philemon, he, I mean, Onesimus, he probably was brought in as, as, a, as a teenager, a young guy, and then he got, you know, a little testosterone coursing through him and said, man... I'm going to do what I want to do, and I don't care if I get caught or not. You know, I think he had a lot of machismo, and then I think he got to Rome, and he realized it's pretty hard being, you know, living on the streets, man. And I'm seeing all these people with Fs on their forehead, and I don't want to, you know, be like that. And I see all these people getting crucified. I don't want. Maybe he's thinking, man, I'm going to get caught any day. Man, I, I can't live like this anymore. And so God intervened with his life. And, and he was not some sewer rat, but he met the Apostle Paul. And uh, now he's useful to Paul. Think about that. What was he doing for Paul? We have no idea. But if Paul's in prison and house arrest, maybe he was going to get fresh fruits and vegetables for Paul. Paul's like, man, I could sure use a nice pomegranate. You know, Onesimus, you know, would you go and get me a fresh pomegranate? And, and man, my blanket's kind of got some holes in it. Well, Onesimus, would you please go in, in, into the market? Here's some coins. Give me a fresh blanket. And give me some Charmin toilet paper, man. I can't take this John Wayne stuff they got going on here. And, and uh, man, I'd sure like some, you know, macadamia nuts. Or I, I don't know what he was doing. Maybe he's like, hey, would you please take this letter to the post office for me, Onesimus? You know, I, I could just see Onesimus just being, because he says he's like, he's like a son to me. And he, he's become useful. And, and I'm sending him, verse 12, I'm sending him who is my very heart. Think about that for a minute. All right, here's my heart. Don't hurt it. Don't break it. Don't mistreat my heart. Onesimus is my very heart. What a powerful statement. Not only is he my son, but he's my very heart. My feelings are entwined with him. Wow. I think this would make an incredible movie. When you read the book of Ephesus, and we read the book of Acts, you see that Paul was in Ephesus, and um, 
Let me just read to you a little bit about Ephesus uh, from Ch Acts chapter 19 because Paul was there for two years in Ephesus. And Ephesus, as we saw, it was like a major seed port of that whole Asia area. And um, it says that Paul would, would teach in the synagogues and then every day he would go and he would uh, uh, teach at the school of Tyr Tyrannus. And so commentators say that that school of Tyrannus was probably like a lecture hall where they would have different philosophers and different people speak. And so there would be guest speakers all the time at this hall of Tyrannus. And so all the merchants and all the business people and all these different intellectuals would come to that hall of Tyrannus. And they would hear different people speak. And so Paul was there every single day and he had these opportunities to speak. And so uh, Philemon was probably like a wealthy merchant doing some business in, in the capital of Ephesus, and he hears the gospel. He's like, wow, I, I'm going to accept Christ. And so he, he develops a friendship with Paul, and, and then he opens a church in, in Colossae or Laodicea. And so they have this connection because of what Paul was doing in, in Ephesus. And then now um, he's got the church in his home, and Paul says he, he's sending Onesimus back. And so I just, I just, in my mind, I kind of picture this scene. They're, they're having home church, right? And, and they just sang a hymn, and all of a sudden, wait, who's at the door? Somebody go get the door. And so one of the servants opens the door, and lo and behold, there is Onesimus standing at the door. Oh, my gosh, Onesimus, the guy that left us high and dry, the guy that, see, what we understand from this is he probably stole something to make his journey out to Rome. So he stole some money or he stole some household stuff and he made off like a bandit and, and, and left the house in a lurch. So if you were a large household and you had a servant that was over some areas and you paid money for that servant and then now they're gone, not only are they gone, the value of that servant's gone, but the value of what they're doing, now you've got to have, bring in somebody else and try to fix that, plus the value of what you lost. I mean, what did he take? Who knows? But we'll learn more next week what Paul says about this. But here is this scoundrel that stole and, and left him high and dry. There he is at the door. What's Onesimus feeling? I mean, what's, what's Paul feeling? What's Onesimus feeling at that moment? Standing at the door of the place that you did wrong. I would have liked to keep him, verse 13, I wonder if, if, if uh, Philemon said, yeah, I wish you would have, if his flesh didn't just think that. Yeah, you should have kept him. I don't want him. I don't like him. We, we talk bad about him around here. You know, he did us wrong, man. He really hurt us. I, 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 just, I, just, I, I just imagine, you know, the, the, the humanity of it all, realizing that there's this guy that did us wrong, and here he is. And not only is he here, but now he has this letter that he's delivering, and okay, let's open that up. Oh, from Paul? Oh, my gosh, it's from Paul. And then, oh, Paul wants me to do what? Very personal. My son. I did not want to do anything without your consent. Verse 14, so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. Verse 15, perhaps, I like this. Have you ever uh, kind of speculated about what God's doing Sometimes Paul would speak with boldness and say, this is what the word is, and this is what God is, is doing, and this is what Christ says. But right here, I love this, because Paul is like saying, eh, perhaps, and we all do that too. It's like, perhaps God is at work in this area, and we're not quite sure, but we're, we're kind of putting the pieces together and saying, man, I'm seeing God work. And so Paul is like saying, okay, perhaps Onesimus came to my you know, cell, and, and perhaps he became a Christian, and perhaps he's been discipled, and now that he's going back, perhaps he can actually make a huge difference where he came from. And, and something great can come out of this whole situation, perhaps. Isn't that wonderful? Perhaps the reason that he was separated from you for a little while so that you might have him back for good. Verse 16, look at this. Oh my. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear. Yo, what does it say? As a dear what? Oh, wow. He's no longer a slave, but he's better than a slave. He is a dear brother. And so the, the teachings of Christ 
are revolutionary. They turn everything upside down on their head, and we need to really grab onto this because as human beings, we are the ones who have our little silly dividing lines and our little levels of this or that, and we kind of judge people based on this or that. It's just so pathetic and shallow and dumb. And, and over and over and over again, we are reminded that that worldly mindset is not the mindset of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, before Paul even starts talking about the gifts, this is what he says. He says, for there is one spirit, and we were all baptized into one body of believers, whether you're a Jew or a Greek or a slave or free, we are one in Christ. No division, he says here in Corinthians 12. In Galatians chapter 3, he says, there's neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free nor male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. We make all these crazy divisions. God does not. When we come to Christ, we are one. Oh, man, the church needs to grab a hold of this today and begin to reteach all of the broken mindsets that are out there. We need to be the church again. As they were the church, their church at that time began to turn the world up on its head by pushing back these different ideas and saying, no, we are one. And we love each other as brothers and as sisters, and we serve one another. We wash each other's feet. We care. When one hurts, we all hurt. And so they, by this you will know my, that they are my disciples, that you are my disciples, Jesus said, as you love one another. Colossians also says the same thing. When you put on the new and you've been renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created you. There is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian, slave or free, but Christ. Christ. So you see what the Bible teaches us? Is that Christ unites us. Christ teaches us a new way to see one another. No longer as a slave, but as a dear brother, very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So the thing to do back then would have been to punish the slave or to kill the slave, to make an example. With Paul saying, no, I want you to receive him as my son. I want you to receive him as my heart. And I want you to see him be useful for you as he's useful for me. Wow, isn't that amazing? What hope that has for all of us. All of us, Martin Luther says that, that Onesimus is like all of us. We're all of us. We're all slaves to sin, aren't we? We're slaves to sin. We run away from God. We find redemption. And then God begins to transform us, and now we begin to be useful for him and his kingdom. So three things that we've pulled out of here. Number one, a love and forgiveness are possible through what? Good works and through being a nice person. Is that, is that how love and forgiveness are possible by going to church all the time? No, no, no. They're possible through Christ. Christ is what makes love. It says that we love because he first loved us. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice for our sins. That is love. Christ is love. His sacrifice is love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. So love and forgiveness are possible through Christ. We receive it, and then we also must give it back. Love is better than guilt. How many of you know that's true? Love is better than guilt. So we're to be people of love. Not guilt, not shame, but love. Number three, love and forgiveness changes our relationships, doesn't it? It'll transform a family. It'll transform a marriage. It'll transform a community. It'll transform a church. It transforms society. And today, we need to see transformed lives, transformed families, transformed communities, transformed everything because of Christ. So I pray that we'll take this message to heart and, uh, and see ourselves 
in the story, extending love and grace to others. I want to close today with a, um, a passage from uh, what's called the Apostolic Fathers. And so what this is, this is church history. The Apostolic Fathers is kind of a, a collection of the um, <clears throat> different letters from the first and second centuries. And 50 years after Paul wrote this, uh, a guy by the name of uh, Ignatius, and he was a bishop in Smyrna, and he wrote a letter to the bishop in Ephesus and um, extolling him and saying what a great servant of God he was. And so it's interesting that the bishop of Ignatius writing to the bishop of Ephesus, and he names this bishop of, of, of Ephesus as Onesimus. And so most historians believe that Onesimus not only was received by Philemon, but he also became an integral part of that church, so much so being discipled by Paul that he was actually put in charge of a group of churches in Ephesus. And so the one that was once useless is now useful. And that gives us so much hope for all of us. I don't know what you've done. I don't know where you've run to or what you're trying to hide from or escape from, but God can take us in our stupidity and fallenness and brokenness, restore us, and make us useful for his kingdom. That's what God does. It's amazing. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, thank you for your redeeming love. Thank you for your great forgiveness. Thank you for offering us forgiveness through Jesus on the cross. Thank you that our sins are washed away and that we stand clean and cleansed and washed because of the blood of Christ. And if anyone here today has not received that payment, Lord, today I pray that they say, yes, Jesus, come in my life. Change me, transform me, forgive me. Lord, I want to serve you. Lord, I thank you for those that um, desire to serve you and be useful for your kingdom and make a difference for you. Lord, strengthen them. Lord, I pray that we would be about your work, that we would be uh, serving and laboring and we'd be your good soldiers. Lord, help us to continue to be disciplined even though things that come against us and uh, oppose us. Lord, may we stand firm in your word. Lord, I pray that we would see the transformation take place in our lives, in our families' lives. If anyone's here today and they, they're holding on to a grudge or to a bitterness that today they say, Lord, I let go of that. I release that person. Lord, I forgive that person. Lord, give them the power, give them the strength to be able to do and to love and to forgive as you have loved. Thank you for the difference you make. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.